Tom. Um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we've had such distinguished speakers on the topic of ETS to take a slightly broader perspective um, in terms of the industry, uh, an airport's perspective, because I come from an airport, but hopefully uh, a broader industry experience. Hopefully I don't need to uh, introduce the AA at any great length to the audience here, but suffice to say that we operate the, the three main airports in Ireland, um, just a little under 23 million passengers. And uh, in addition to that, we operate uh, retail, airport retail activities in 20 countries worldwide. So we've got a broad perspective on the industry. And um, in fact, a, a lot of our operations worldwide are outside of the EU. Um, so 96% of the traffic into and out of Ireland and 74% from on the island of Ireland covered within our uh, airports. And just to give an idea of the importance of aviation in a small country like Ireland, uh, we have the 14th largest airport in, in Europe for international traffic, the 24th worldwide. Um, Dublin to London is still, it has been for many years, the busiest route, uh, international route in Europe and the fourth busiest in the world. Um, we have extensive long haul connectivity uh, not just from Dublin, but when you take somewhere like Shannon Airport, Shannon Airport has more transatlantic passengers than capital cities in Europe, like Warsaw, Lisbon, and Athens. Um, and Cork Airport um, in the south carried five times the county's population through its, uh, its doors last year. Um, economic growth, economic activity, and aviation are inextricably linked. Um, I think from an airport's perspective, we probably feel the link, the link is primarily economic activity first drives passengers, but clearly it's a two-way relationship. And that's recognized by uh, industry players generally, uh, the aircraft manufacturers, the regulators. Um, again, it's borne out over a very long period of time in terms of the uh, very strong correlation between worldwide economic activity and traffic activity. So anything that impacts economics, economic activity in the world, impacts passenger numbers and propensity to travel. More close to home, that correlation again is strikingly borne out. Somewhat uh, happily in the years of the boom period, the uh, elasticity of traffic to uh, economic activity in Ireland meant that we had a very strong uh, growth in passenger numbers. Um, slightly more painfully in recent years, that elasticity has, uh, has borne a drop in passenger numbers relative to economic activity. But as you can see, across all of the markets, there's a, an uncanny uh, correlation between passenger uh, growth and economic activity. Uh, tends to be a little bit more, uh, less elasticity in very mature markets like uh, the US and the UK. So if you take an index going back, in this case, to 1995, again, just bearing out the um, symbiotic relationship between world uh, passenger traffic and economic growth. And I think we all live in an environment where we are expecting, and indeed our lifestyles are anticipating continued economic development and economic growth over the, the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, in the case of Ireland, even more pronounced. Uh, Notwithstanding the, um, the peak and subsequent fall in traffic, Irish traffic has grown on a compound average over the last 20 years by 6.3%, which is double the rate of growth uh, worldwide. And just really looking at an Irish traffic comparison over the last 10 years, again, notwithstanding what you can see there in terms of a peak on the green bar, well above the level of uh, growth in the rest of uh, the European markets, where we have positioned and where we've ended in 2011 is bang on the European average um, and, uh, and, and in excess again of where some of the, um, the more mature economies would have, uh, would have ended up. So apart from economics, what are the other issues that drive aviation traffic or drive the demand? Well, fuel is certainly one. And I think, depending on the airline, the proportion of their cost base that is um, 
borne by fuel, and you can see there just three comparisons which show quite a, a wide range. Um, uh, Ryanair, an airline that we're, we're all familiar with in this market, um, a very high proportion of their cost base is uh, related to their fuel cost, and that is both a function of the fact that they're, they uh, have such a tight control of the remainder of their cost base, but it is also a reason why when fuel prices are high or when other um, uh, factors are driving up, the cost of operating their aircraft, they can simply take uh, aircraft out of their fleet and out of activity, as they've done this year. Um, similarly, uh, for other airlines, the, um, the fuel costs are the single biggest factor in their, in their P&L. IATA this year have just recently forecast a 62% drop in airline profits for this year because of the current fuel prices. There are, of course, other issues, regional instability. We saw just at a, a localised level, um, sun destinations in southern Europe had a very good year last year because of the fact that um, uh, Middle East and North African territories were not desirable places to travel for a, for a period of time. Weather, we of course saw the, um, the volcanic ash impact, which had a, an enormous cost for the industry as a whole. And destination-specific issues. When we come to destinations, this is a chart that uh, Airbus have used, um, again showing the propensity to travel relative to, uh, in this case, per capita income. Um, the world is, uh, starts with fairly undeveloped countries which are traveling at a rate of 0 0.01 per capita. Um, the world average is up here a little bit between 0.1 and 1, so about a half uh, a trip per person, per country. And then uh, the developed countries, but, but particularly those above the line, are small island economies, or economies which are um, far from their trading partners, are very open economies like Singapore and Ireland here, uh, Iceland, uh, I'd say they had, a, they had an impact in 2010 during the, uh, the volcanic crash. But the importance of aviation to countries like Ireland, to other countries on the map even when they're less developed, is uh, not to be understated. W what else is happening in the market? I mean, one of the reasons I think that the territoriality issue is becoming a bigger issue for the industry is because the growth is outside of the EU and the US. These are the short-term 20 current uh, short-term rates of growth that are forecast. So still reasonably healthy growth rates of 2 and 3% in the mature markets like the US and Europe. Uh, these are obviously average rates, and they'll vary from market to market. But 7% in the Far East, 7% in the Middle East, 6% in Latin America. And these are continuation of trends that we've seen over the last number of years bring that forward to 2030, and the landscape of aviation has changed completely. Um, from being roughly comparable to the US and Europe uh, today, the Far East um, will have more than double the amount of traffic in either of those markets, and in fact has almost as much as the rest of the world combined. Um, and you can also see Markets like uh, Latin America and Africa have outstripped the growth rate of the, uh, the mature markets by a considerable degree during that period. Another factor that's happening in the market, not necessarily being driven by ETS, but certainly something that can be um, accelerated, is the degree to which Europeans, Europe is becoming bypassed. Those markets, those demographics are not um, the, the, the history of air travel where people travelled to and from the mature markets to developed markets. Now the travel is happening between developing markets. These are a selection of new routes, major new routes started between developing markets which are bypassing uh, Europe, bypassing North America and indeed in many cases bypassing the Middle East. Um, direct connections from uh, from uh, China into Africa, direct connections from Moscow into, um, into Latin America. 
aviation is a big industry in and of itself. Airports are big industries in and of themselves. Um, just in terms of, of looking at that, some of the statistics here surprised me. Munich Airport being Bavaria's second largest employer. There are a lot of big companies that we're very familiar with in, uh, in Bavaria, but yet the Munich Airport is the second biggest employer. Amsterdam representing, Amsterdam Airport representing 2% of GDP for um, the Netherlands. So the scale of the industry and the scale of the impact means that any of these uh, innovations or any of the changes in the market dynamics are something that we need to be conscious of. Um, similarly in Ireland, uh, taken all told, about 120,000 people uh, whose jobs are reliant on the aviation industry and about 1.35 billion to the public finances. It's not just here, um, economic development, this is, this is the ad that if you travel on the uh, tube in London at the moment you'll see quite prominently. Clearly it is um, British Airports Authority again raising the issue of the need for additional runway capacity in London, but emphasising the importance and the linkage between economic growth for the UK and uh, the necessary airport capacity. Um, something that is recognised in, in planning terms internationally, where you take some of the examples in the Far East where really radical airport development um, approaches have been made, uh, airports and runways essentially built on man-made islands. And even in the US, um, despite the fact that the, uh, the growth has been less there, uh, a recent study showing that public support for airport expansion in their local area would be overwhelmingly positive. So just really turning back to the environmental debate, um, I, I suppose one of the issues, this is a little bit of research that we did, but it bears out a lot of um, other industry, uh, more widespread industry um, studies to say, what makes people travel? Well, the primary reason that people travel is because they need to get there. It's the destination, it's the, it's the reason for traveling. Um, so things like times and meetings of flights, um, the, the way you travel, the, the connections, those are all important things for business travels travellers, a bit less so for leisure travellers. Um, and somewhere in the middle, or a little bit closer to the, to the top for leisure, is price. And of course that's the dimension that um, ETS and any of the other initiatives may well impact. Um, in terms of the direct charges to date, Ryanair have a well publicised 25 cents per passenger uh, levy that they have included. Um, Delta have maintained that they've increased uh, fuel surge charges by three euros. Um, other airlines are understood to have done so. And I think the, the general comment that has been made is that in the overall scheme of things, that those do not look like they are particularly market distorting changes, um, particularly given the relativity of price in the decision making process. Um, but the, the expectation that these prices can simply be passed through <clears throat> implies that the market has been underpricing to date <clears throat> if, if any change in price isn't going to impact demand. The, <clears throat> the industry recognises absolutely the need to um, place the environment uh, to the forefront of planning uh, to safeguard its own future. And there are a range of issues that have been mentioned already in presentations. Um, IATA's own industry-wide uh, goals for carbon reduction, the um, technology changes, the um, single European skies initiatives which essentially will try and uh, uh, allow flights to, to operate in more direct uh, flight paths and reduce fuel burn, particularly on approach and, and takeoff, and the uh, introduction of biofuels. Lufthansa have recently uh, generated the first uh, transatlantic biofuel uh, flight on a commercial, uh, commercial jet. If we take the, the um, example of Dublin Airport, uh, people will be familiar with the new Terminal 2 that we have introduced in the last year. Again, the principle there was to design uh, a facility that was uh, efficient, um, 
that the design incorporated environmental features like glazing and cladding, which reduced emissions, and the building has been designed to achieve a 20% lower rate of energy consumption than uh, comparable terminal buildings or than building regulations generally. Um, at an industry level, there is the airport carbon accreditation scheme, um, ACI sponsored. Um, it, it has got membership now of 55 airports, which represent um, over half the, the traffic in Europe and, um, and, and contains four carbon accreditation levels. Um, our airports in Ireland are Shannon Airport at level one and Dublin and Cork Airport at level two. And just again to give a context for um, the uh, reduction in carbon in a year, our Irish airports combined reduced carbon emissions by 3,500 tonnes last year, which is the equivalent of taking uh, 1,100 cars off the road. Now, these may seem like relatively small numbers in an overall industry, but these are the sort of technology changes, I think, that, um, that the uh, overall industry across the world are going to need to meet the uh, emissions targets. So from an, from an airport's perspective, the, the title of this um, seminar includes the term trade war. And I suppose the biggest concern that airports have is that we become the battleground for the trade war. Airports in Europe become um, the ones where, quite logically, uh, political uh, constituents and the public expect us to be um, the source of tourists, to be the, um, the uh, part of the growth engine for the economy, and uh, we would be concerned that within the EU context, that European airports, that European aviation will be disadvantaged, that if there is a trade war, that uh, European airports will be the ones that will be seen to lose traffic, and, uh, and finally, that, um, that th any reduction in the ability to travel will have a consequent impact on uh, European economic growth, which I think the, the consequences at the moment are unforeseen. So thank you.